Hello, this is Carl. Welcome back to Apparent Faith Videos. This is a companion to my book, <clears throat> Apparent Faith, What Fatherhood Taught Me About the Father's Heart. This chapter is called Tribalism, Nationalism, Empire, Violence, and War. How about that for a title? Um, one of my son's friends hated Canada. I don't know. I don't have any idea why. I don't know if he was being humorous or, or whether he really did hate Canada. Maybe he had a legitimate reason, but it was some type of coping me mechanism, maybe just something that he was playing around with, and maybe something to cope with racism and, and stuff that he saw. I don't know. Um, you know, small town uh, tribalism can be an interesting thing. Um, we lived in some small towns where eight miles away there would be another small town that sang the same songs at church, dressed the same, talked the same, yet high school football could bring out a rivalry that would last for decades. Uh, even Little League sports sometimes you would hear, we hate those Trojans or we hate the Tigers. They're, you know, and, the, and the, all these people were similar people that live similar lives, but that tribalism can flare up. Uh, eventually it gets to the college level where uh, young people, and we watched our children choose their college, and sometimes with, with a lot of thought, but most times just because someone else they knew had gone there, or it was the situation of money, and that's where they ended up, but that becomes your school, and once it's your school, then um, we, we get very tribalistic about it. Um, you know, I, my wife went to the University of Texas, and I, went, I, I lived near the University of Oklahoma. And so at football time, we have this rivalry that's really based on our parents' circumstances and how we got there, not really on anything noble or and, and really the... Well, both schools are probably really good, and, and many of the people that go to both schools are really good, but we can come, become very territorial, very tribalistic about that. The, um, yesterday, I was driving down the highway and just noticed the amount of Nebraska cars and Kansas cars that were going by me here in Missouri, and of course, I get very sarcastic about that pretty quick, like they're probably just trying to get out of their state, you know, and... You know, you, you get kind of ugly and, and and tribalistic just about that. Um, Brene Brown calls that common enemy intimacy. She said, common enemy intimacy is counterfeit connection and the opposite of true belonging. If the bond we share with others is simply that we hate the same people, the intimacy we experience is often intense and it's immediately gratifying and an easy way to discharge outrage and pain. It is not, however, real fuel for real connection. So um, being able to discuss what is different about them is a horrible basis for a friendship, yet we do it all the time. Nationalism, though, is different. Nationalism begins to kind of creep in um, it plays on my need to label and compare so that I feel superior to other people, and it provokes an us versus them mentality. Patriotism may not be all that bad. It's not uh, in its root form. But if we, my people, are not the best, it's probably their fault, and that's how nationalism starts. Nationalism leads to a subhuman categorization of other people. Nationalism is not congruent with the way of Christ because um, he went out of his way um, to, to be with people like the Samaritans and he didn't consider people other. There's the example of Rome at the apex of its nationalistic quest for empire. And, and Rome really conquered the world. Um, Jesus, on the other hand, launched a countercultural um, culture in the first century that lasted almost 300 years. Uh, the church refused to join with the empire, but occasionally we see in history some hope. We see the civil rights movement, we see leaders like Mandela 
Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, all these people fought for equality, not superiority. Uh, according to Jesus, the second half of human history was supposed to be characterized by love, mercy, <clears throat> and grace. And I think if Jesus were here today, he wouldn't pledge allegiance to a nation. Um, how could he choose between his American children and his, his Mexican children? Um, he couldn't be, would he be, I don't think he would be Protestant or Catholic. I don't think he'd be Buddhist or Muslim. Um, the failed experiment of nationalism has been teased out several times in history to its inevitable conclusion. Uh, it should never be tried again. It always ends in destruction. My son and his friend I talked about turned out fine. Um, my son is, has been teaching me a deeper type of compassion. Um, he has great confidence in himself. He lives in Taiwan without having to hate other groups. Um, he is the other in his community right now, the minority, um, but he gets along fine. My daughters also, I think, are leading me home. Uh, all I can say is I'm learning, and it helps when I when I'm to embrace the refugee by understanding that Jesus was also once a refugee. So after the Canada thought process, I considered military service for my son and thought that would be a good way to get him through college. I saw the economy of it. My wife saw that he might be in battle somewhere. My, his life might be in danger. When the World Trade Centers were bombed, I tuned in like most of Americans. Um, it was like watching an action movie when George Bush stood up on the wreckage and vowed revenge, I, I cheered inside. Uh, I felt like I was vindicated. I watched uh, the future invasions and I was proud. I knew the teachings of Jesus on violence, but I nicely kind of set those aside for the moment and I felt proud to be an American. Later on I visited the Washington DC monuments. In Washington I saw at night the, the different monuments that were lit up at night and it made me kind of patriotic. But the, eventually I found the Korean War Memorial and the Korean War Memorial is very uh, moving I think. It ha has the soldiers in raincoats, and it's kind of dimly lit at night. And my mind went back to my grandpa, who served in World War II, that never talked about it. He would never mention a word about the war. And as I moved through the memorials that had the names all over the wall, I looked at that Korean War memorial, and very simply, I just cried. I wasn't angry, I wasn't mad, I was just sad. The early church faced persecution um, for the first 300 years. They suffered, but they flourished um, just kind of in an indescribable way. Um, Constantine eventually convinced the church to join with the empire, the same one that was killing Christians. And not too long after that, Christians were eventually killing Christians. And this, after Constantine, just never really stopped. There's just been an endless stream of just wars. Uh, Hitler's army was composed mostly of Protestants and Catholics. Um, that's the inevitable end to that compromise. Um, something changed in me, and I wanted to read to you from my book. Something changed in my worldview a few years ago. Up until then, I had accepted that violence was simply a reality of life, and I assumed even God understood that we could only take so much. After all, he is portrayed as angry and retributive at times, but Jesus did not accept that supposed reality. When the empire that encircled his world promoted a culture of violence and conquest, Jesus offered an alternative reality of peace. While his Jewish culture was hoping he would bring justice in the form of military might, he stayed true to his message of nonviolence, love of enemies, and compassion for all people. 
Slowly I began to accept the Jesus paradigm with all its mystery, uncertainty, and paradox. I do not have an end to this story. I live in a country that has made nationalism into an alternative religion. The us versus them sentiment is strong even among those that follow the Prince of Peace. I do not know how this story is going to end. It seems like one option is to keep killing each other uh, and hope like hell that God is on our side. I find that hard to fathom now, especially since my country has spent most of its short history exterminating the natives of its land, enslaving people from another continent, and engaging in war at every opportunity. With all the blood on our hands, the possibility or probability of God being on our side, if that's even a thing, seems unlikely. There is another option, though. We can follow the prophets and the poets and imagine alternative outcome like Jesus did. You know, Little League sports is one thing, and we can laugh that off, but it gets more serious as it moves up the line. Uh, we, could, we could imagine a world that loves its enemies, a world that does not return evil for evil. We could change in our own tribes, in our own villages, and work from there. You know, when I speak this way, when I talk about stuff like this, often you get the love it or leave it speech, um, that I'm not loving my country. I say nothing could be further from the truth. I'm extremely impressed with the United States and the American church, but the experiment has become flawed. In several ways I don't we don't have to trash the whole thing but we need to examine the parts of the experiment that have failed um, less like Constantine maybe more like Jesus my son eventually went overseas like I mentioned um, there's still some danger but at least the primary purpose is not war I've actually been encouraged um, by the Taiwanese people who seem to be pretty Christ-like <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and sometimes my immediate neighbors are not like that. Ultimately, the father's heart for his children it was, is that they would learn to get along. Uh, it's a simple directive to love our neighbor. Um, it's not easy, but it's possible.